Democratic Labour Party. What Barbados? United is a must. For sure you can trust the Democratic Labour Party. The
A blessed good evening to every one of you out there in Facebook land and joining us on YouTube. This is the Democratic Labour Party streaming their meeting live. My name is Comrade Adrian Bascom and now let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for yet another evening where we can join either by through cyberspace or wherever we may be. I ask you, Lord, to bless every speaker. Lord, bless the chairman of this virtual meeting. Bless the speakers that will come. Continue to touch every one of us, even the song man, Lord God, those that may be unaware. Touch all of the candidates, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to endeavor to save Barbados. Lord, I ask you these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Good night, good night, ladies and gentlemen. Good night, good night, good night, wherever you are. The party of the people marches upward and onward again. And as we bring our virtual meeting from the headquarters of the Democratic Labour Party, I want to thank Conrad Baskin for those sweet words of praise and encouragement. This party, the party of Errol Walton Barrow, founder, father of independence, national hero, has gone through many trials and tribulations. But whenever we, we have fallen down, our members here in Barbados and our members all across the diaspora have always, always picked us up, dusted us off, dusted us off, and sent us to do their work. I was at Hagen Hall last night, and a tear almost fell because the spectacle was amazing. Not the production only, but the array of talent put on show before the entire world when six weeks ago I was hearing the Democratic Labour Party is not ready. For six months, every day on the calling program, the host and hostesses, that way, we're saying the Democratic Labour Party doesn't have any candidates struggling to find people to contest the election. But last night, for the entire world to witness, 30 young men and women walked across the Hackett Hall stage and announced their candidature for this election. What a wonderful sight. And those men and women who who organized the music, the sounding, the lighting, the stage, must, be, must take a bow because it was an exciting night without one single mix-up. As you are aware, the COVID has meant that we've had to do more virtual meetings than we would normally have done because we have been limited to three meetings on the outside. So we are here again addressing our followers, our supporters, and also addressing Barbadians who have Barbados at heart. We are appealing to those Barbadians who may not even like the Democratic Labour Party as well. We are asking them to internalize what is happening to Barbados. And we are confident once you internalize what is happening to Barbados, then you will support the Democratic Labour Party as it sets out to rescue democracy and to place this country on a path of good governance as it has always known. 
I guess I can take my mask off since I'm up here by myself. I would not be infringing any protocol rules, I don't think. And this mic is my mic. Now, my task is simple. Keep this meeting moving. Keep the speakers flowing. Keep the audience living, li listening. So I'm not going to go any further. I have a few little chits and chats to make. But I want to introduce our first speaker tonight. Now, I was in St. George North by election, principal cheerleader, right up front, urging and pulling and pushing and begging and keeping my, my, my party going. And I went to a spot meeting somewhere around Cottage. I can't remember exactly which cottage was part of Cottage, but somewhere near Cottage. I remember the word Cottage. And if people know Derek Allen, I find some place that will wet my appetite. So I went by a nearby um, tavern, tavern, and they introduced a young lady. The name did not hit me, because it was not a name that I could remember. But once that young lady started to talk, all of us who had, who had moved aside to tavernize the night, started to approach the van on which she was standing. For about 25 to 30 minutes, the only thing you could hear was her voice and the applause from the audience. A small audience, about 15 of us. But so electrifying, so educational, and so on point was her message that the entire audience were caught spellbound by the confidence that she displayed, her temperament, and her grasp of the issues facing Barbados. Only today, I was having lunch, and I met her father-in-law. He said, go look after my princess. Ladies and gentlemen, the candidate for St. George South, Don Marie Armstrong. Moving strong with Armstrong. Make Dawn Marie Armstrong the DLP representative for St. George South. Dawn is a woman for the people and is ready to serve and uplift the community. Dawn is committed to providing unbiased representation to everyone and will work hard to ensure that all voices across the constituency's respective communities are heard. So on January 19th, do the right thing by moving strong with Dawn Armstrong. Moving strong with Armstrong. Good night to everyone online. Good night to my comrades at George Street. We are running a marathon in this election. Such a short space of time given to let Barbados know that the Democratic Labour Party is ready to serve them once again. But the commitment that we have put in on the road, the houses that we have touched in these short few days, I mean, we could say a week and a half, but in reality, there are really days and hours that we are counting and getting to the finish line. And when I say it is a marathon, I mean, we are going from point A to point B to point C. We're organizing our spot meetings. We're tele-canvassing, we're going house to house, we're still receiving calls, we're still dealing with our families, still trying to stay committed to our friendships. And for me being a first timer in the race, it is such a thrill to continuously be out there with people, you know, showing them where my heart lies, because we really bear our souls with this thing that people call representation. And as I have told people 
From the time my candidacy was announced in June of 2021, I knew that I would have always been on a political stage. I won my first election at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus. I was the only female amongst four males contesting for the post of Games Committee Chairperson. I had a love for sport. I've always been an athlete. I've represented my country. I've represented Barbados in cricket, represented the West Indies A team in cricket, represented the Caribbean as an overseas player in the, in the United Kingdom. I've even played for the Leeward Islands. I've played county cricket in Scotland. Um, and, and representing people and representing my country is nothing that is new to me. And that is why I say that I am very well qualified and very well equipped, not just academically, but I would even say characteristically, I am very well qualified to represent people. And as I speak to those online and many of you who hail from St. George South, I encourage you that on January 19th, when you head into your respective polling stations, my name is first on the <laughs> first on the ballot and it shall be first over the finish line with your support and I cannot thank you enough for the reception I cannot thank you enough for the opportunity to be able to speak with you and even those who would have been outright honest and say you know I have to go with the other side I even thank them because any vote cast on January 19th is a vote for democracy. We need the voters to come out. We need our young people to come out. We need our elderly to come out. We need our women, our men. We need everyone to come out and cast the vote safely. We cannot tell you enough how important it is for you to get to the polls on January 19th and vote for your Democratic Labour Party representative wherever you are. We have taken over this political landscape. We are dominating the political landscape as we speak physically. We are dominating. And the persons who are seeking to run this race with us, because the race really and truthfully hasn't been run by them, the persons that are seeking to run in this race with us knows that they cannot keep up. And we are ahead. And I put us further ahead because for the first time on this platform here, I will begin to address a serious issue plaguing our youth. And it is called recidivism. And when we speak about recidivism, we speak about repeat offending. We speak about every single person who has committed an offense, who have found themselves in the criminal system, who have found themselves in jail. And I'm not just talking about Glendary or Dodds. We are talking about our young men and women in Somerville, we are talking about our young men and women in the juvenile correction facilities. We are talking about how people begin to fall into this habit, because it is a habit of repeating offenses. And I will show you how this government, with the highest crime rate in the history of this country, has failed its young people. When we talk about the youth, and we talk about the lack of opportunity, and we talk about the crucial role that the youth vote played in 2018 in this country in swinging an election. I would have thought that in 2022, we would have seen a plan laid out for our youth. And I am not just saying I broke it down by demographic a few days ago by demographic, but I am breaking it now, down now by vulnerability. Our young people with criminal records have had it the most difficult in this time. Our young people that have made mistakes, K 
cannot seem to be, be forgiven by the same society that would have raised them. Our systems have failed our young people. And I was speaking to a child advocate just a few days ago. She rang me after. Sorry, I rang her because I saw a broadcast that she sent out after my platform delivery in St. Lucie. She rang me after and she stated, no one ever speaks about our children and, on our, and about our youth on political platforms. And she gave me some shocking statistics. And she stated that every young woman in Somerville, if not all, she stated majority, sorry, if not all of them, were raped before the age of 13 years old. And when I heard that, it hurt me. Because at 13 years old, I was running around playing cricket. At 13 years old, I was leaving the common mayor school after running track and field to go home and do my homework. At 13 years old, I was either at BC track, training for my track and field, going home to eat my dinner, to go to bed, and to think about school in the morning, but no. We have our girls in Somerville who have been abused previously going into a system that will continue to perpetuate that abuse. And not one minister has come out at this time to say how they intend to make our juvenile correction facilities better. But these young men and these young women especially come back into society looking for a chance, looking for a break, and are condemned by a police certificate of character. No jobs. They're branded as being troublemakers. Not once has anyone stopped to think this young woman or this young man may need additional help. But you say counseling. Oh, they had counseling, but what type of counseling? There are talking therapies and there are doing therapies. There is psychology and there is psychiatry. How do we know what assistance our young people need if they are not working with qualified people to be able to determine what they need in order to receive assistance? Trauma is deep. And without the adequate therapies, we cannot be convinced that we are adequately assisting our young men and women. And here you have a young woman leaving Somerville, probably going back into the school system, probably not. Lost her way. Can't get a job. Asking for help, but branded as trouble. And then when they, find, when they find themselves trying to make ends meet. And then they end up in an adult correction facility. That's the end of it for them. But I say to my young audience tonight, I say to the parents tonight, if I am speaking to you and you have a young son or a young daughter in your home who is struggling with getting back on the straight and narrow because this government has failed them. I, Dawn Marie Armstrong, say to you tonight that I will lobby for an arm of the public service, for an arm of the civil service to begin to employ young offenders, to decrease the rates of recidivism in this country. Our young people need to feel as if when they have made a mistake, that they can continue to have a life in this country. And you brand them, our young men, as boys on the block. And I cannot stand the term. I call them young men in waiting. Why? Because they are waiting for opportunities. Why? Because they are waiting for their politicians to fulfill their promises. Why? Because they are waiting for their politicians to put some action behind their plans. They are not boys on the block. They are men in waiting. And I refuse to sit back and let you continue to speak on young men in such a derogative way because you have failed to 
provide. And it has been alleged that again you are going to our young men, even in St. George South. You are going to our young men yet again to use them as a token to attempt to win a seat and to win an election. But I say that my young men in St. George South have came to me and told me that they will no longer fall by the wayside of politics. The young men in St. George South have told me, Dawn Marie, in you we see vision. Dawn Marie, in you we see opportunity. Dawn Marie, in you we see humanity and you understand us. And I speak from a place of understanding because I work with young men and women and all young men and women want all across the world is to feel understood. They want communication. They need intervention. They need people who will come and sit and speak with them, not once every five years. They need to know that there is someone who truly will take up their cause and fight for them. And I say that I, Dawn Marie Armstrong, as I stand here in the home of the Democratic Labour Party, I will fight for our young people from now until the day that I close my eyes. For I too am young and I understand. Stop using our young men and women as a pawn. You hurt their parents when you come to their houses telling them, oh, I have an opportunity. This is what I will do. And when elections are done, you pack up and you go. And you drop off a hamper. Or you drop off a voucher, knowing very well that families need sustainability. Young men and women need jobs. Young men and women need money. And I understand that money is a ticklish subject for many, but young men and women need money. Not money once every five years. Young men and women need wages. They need salaries. They need contracts, they need jobs. They need ministers in government who will lobby for funding to ensure that projects are taken off of the ground that have their best interests at heart. When you hurt our young people, you hurt me. And when I am hurt, I stand up and I fight back. I have made it my mission to take up the cause of our young people. I have made it my mission to take up the cause of our parents because I have repeatedly said every young person that has been failed, it is a household that has been failed as well. When you hamper with our future, when you tamper with our future, and you tamper with our young people. You bring a generational form of bondage upon that family that can never be broken unless families are given the opportunities that are able to facilitate their development and their growth. But we don't want to hear those conversations. Because for some reason, the Barbados Labour Party and Don Marie Armstrong chooses to focus on the messenger and not the message. But I say that this government has failed us and you cannot stay this course because we do not know which course we are on. We are on a course of confusion. We are on a course of deception. We are on a course of distraction. And if I hear it one more time on this campaign trail, stay the course. Stay the course. What course? 
the course that allowed 29 parliamentarians to say mute. When needing to speak on the issues of people in this country, what course? You do not deserve one X. When the people of Barbados needed representation, not one of them could have opened their mouths and speak up about the things that were being done on, in this country and you say to stay the course. What course are you on? But to keep the people of Barbados silent and placated with vultures and hampers because you know that they are in need. The politics of dependency syndrome. You have kept my people in bondage for too long and I say that the Democratic Labour Party will free them. Politics of vultures and hampers. You have reduced the Barbadian people to less than nothing because of power. But the Democratic Labour Party speaks of empowerment and I, Dom Marie Armstrong, a facilitator of that, will see the pride in this country restored. You keep our people hungry and then brag about how you have fed them. Shame on the Barbados Labour Party and shame on this government. A people that gave you every single bit of hope and faith, believing that you had our best interests at heart, but we now know that you only serve your own interests and we will have no more of it. On January 19th, the Barbados electorate, the electors across all 30 constituencies will go and mark their, their X for who they want and not who the prime minister tells them to. It ends on January 19th. Barbados will be restored. Barbados shall be resurrected and Barbados shall be redeemed. And on that note, I will be heading to Middleton tonight for my spot meeting. And I encourage you guys to come out and join me. We have many issues to cover, many. I have a whole slate of issues to cover. But I thank you so much for listening. I thank you for your support. But what is needed to be said by me will be said. And I will not be silenced. Vote for the Democratic Labour Party on January 19th. Vote for Dawn Marie Armstrong in St. George South. And vote for democracy to be restored in this country. And on that note, I thank you. <laughs> One Barbados for you and me, we go in with DLP. DLP for all of me, we go in with DLP. One Barbados for you and me, we go in with DLP. DLP for all of me. We got the plan to save this nation. Together we stand with the Democratic Labour Party. One Barbados. I tell you, I tell you, boy, fire. <laughs> fire. You see, the one distract <laughs> Domri back there. They don't know that they pull a tigress tail. If you pull a tigress tail, you can only expect some fire from her. Again, she's, she's made the issues very clear. Um, as, a, as a former um, employee of the Barbados Youth Service, I am so, so, so happy that um, this young lady has decided to take up that issue. Um, recidivism has been a major problem, and, and this government... Um, has never seen youth development as something that they have ever treasured. They're like numbers. So they would take somebody to youth service and they would, instead of doing 150 kids and <clears throat> ensuring that a proper program is done, they would broke the program and try to get 400 and make it a six weeks course so that at the end of the year they can say they did six or 12 six weeks courses or something like that so that they can push up numbers rather than doing qualitative um, youth development and youth leadership.
it's a real sad state, and I am happy that Domery has taken the mantle up and is running with it. It's something that this country needs. And God bless her. God give her the strength and the guidance. To, that, that is a difficult job, and I know she has the, the strength of character, the qualifications and skills to make a good hand of it. But when she touched on the issue of hampers and, and, and those things, it, 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 I, was, I was reminded that last year when the government brought out those care packages, I was trying to remember correctly, care packages. I happened to be standing in 2nd Avenue, Alkins, there that's just behind the Eagle Hall, and the trucks were coming around, and of course, people were alerted that they were coming. And I, I wrote at the same at that time a piece in, on social media about using agencies equipped and trained to deliver those kind of um, assistance. That I found it to be unbecoming, and and I can use this word derogatory to have a truck drive wrong and a bag of whatever was in it pass to people. But more amazing was the sight of two defense force men and two policemen or two police jeeps in front and behind the trucks. Now, I don't know, I don't know what the image Barbadians get with, uh, with, with you providing assistance at a time of need in the middle of a pandemic and you got defense force trucks and police um, jeeps and driving through working class communities and the children seeing those kind of images I don't I don't know if you understand how that hit me and that, that image has never ever left me so I'm glad that Amory is on to trying to correct the thinking about providing assistance to people. You don't have to make them look like they're begging. They're, they're not, they're, they're, you, you government decided to provide assistance, but to treat them as though they're, they're going to rush you for them and, and, and they're going to behave you and that they're going to misbehave. No, 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 no. And that is typical of, of this Barbara's Labour Party. There's no sense of caring. There's no apathy. It's just about, for them, controlling and bullying. Now, I want to introduce the next speaker and take a few seconds to, to say something about this speaker. One of my disciplines is trade unionism, and I have had the opportunity to discuss issues with the next speaker. The leadership of any union in Barbados or any place in the developing world is not an easy matter. It, in this changing world, unions have been under pressure as the New World Order determines that workers should take what they get and not what they need. So those that champion the needs and the needs of working class people and the issues confronting workers have to gird their loins and come to the task. A teacher for 34 years, trade unionist for just as long, he has reached the top post of the Barbados Union of Teachers and has remained the champion for teachers for the last at least 15 years since the days of Ronald Jones and that crowd. I want to introduce the candidate for St. Michael's Southeast, Mr. Pedro Shepherd. And I would share this with you. I have a little connection with the, with the, the point. And 
I don't think it would be any surprise to know that Pedro has, I don't want to call all the names of the streets, but the old stomping ground of the Barbist Day Party in an uproar. He has taught generations of children in that area. Ladies and gentlemen, the candidate for St. Michael Southeast, Mr. Pedro Shepard. Roll call. Rodney Grant, absent. Patrick Tannis, absent. Santia Bradshaw, MIA, missing in action. Pedro Shepard, present and always present. Vote for the D's, vote for the D's. Pedro is the man for me now. Vote for the D's, vote for the D's. Thank the tech by the community now. Vote for the D's, vote for the D's. Pedro is the man for me. Vote for the D's, vote for the D's. Good night to the wonderful people of St. Michael, South Central, St. Michael, South East, the city of Bridgetown, St. Michael, South, Christchurch, South, St. Lucy, St. Peter, St. Thomas, St. Joseph, St. Andrew. Good night to Barbados. As you were told, my name is Pedro Shepherd, and I am the candidate for the Democratic Labour Party in St. Michael Southeast. That is a constituency which is, or which was, um, held by the outgoing Minister of Education for the last eight years. And I want to tell you tonight that in my canvassing of that constituency over the last eight months or so, I have been told that the representative was absent for the better part of the eight years. And so tonight I am going to speak to the performance of the incumbent in that constituency for some time. I will speak a little bit about the politics of Barbados because in canvassing the constituency of St. Michael Southeast, it has been a very difficult task. You heard Derek referring to the fact that I taught in the constituency for 34 years, but in canvassing, that 34 years or those 34 years meant nothing in relation to the political life in the constituency. Because persons have been saying to me that all politicians are the same. They come around when it is an election seeking a vote and then you don't see them again for another five years. I have had to convince generations of students that I, Pedro Ricardo Shepherd, will not be like that. I will not forsake them. I have promised them that I will see my job as parliamentary representative, as one to come in the constituency on a regular basis. And I believe that we have to start encouraging politicians to behave like politicians or like representatives. We cannot be too busy for our constituents. So when the outgoing member of parliament can walk around the constituency using the excuse that the Prime Minister had her too busy for her to see the constituents, then something has to be wrong. And I believe this is the opportunity for St. Michael's Southeast 
to correct that wrong. And I believe that this is the opportunity for all Barbadians in all 30 constituencies to correct all the wrongs. Last night in Haggett Hall, I was able to list a number of projects which was done under the Democratic Labour Party during 2008 to 2018. You would not believe the number of projects we were able to achieve during that 10-year period, despite people saying to us that it was a lost decade. If it was a lost decade, and we were able to do so much. Just imagine if we had the last three years to continue the work that we started in 2008. It is the intention, therefore, of the Democratic Labour Party, once regaining the government of Barbados, to continue that work. I want you tonight to ask the outgoing Minister of Education how many schools she built. I want you to ask the Minister of Education tonight how many schools were refurbished during the summer program for the last three years. As a matter of fact, the summer program for this, for last year, is still ongoing. If you go to some schools across Barbados, you will see that they are still being repaired from the onslaught of Elsa. You will still see some of them being cleaned as a result of the ashes. And therefore, the minister ought to thank nature for giving her the extra time to get those schools completed. You will recall when Ronald Jones was minister, we were able to finish all the schools on time. And we were finishing 15 and 16 schools every summer. They had two and three schools to do summer works and could not get them done over the nine-week holiday. As I said last night, the Minister of Education was a total failure. We spoke about reform in education, and the Minister took time to shop around Barbados to find a qualified set of persons to sit on a reform committee. That committee, after months of talk, was finally launched and has as its director a former deputy chief education officer. I believe she means well, but I also believe that she has served her time, and I honestly believe that some other person could have been given the opportunity to push reform in Barbados. And so we have gone nowhere with education reform in Barbados. But we have spent thousands upon thousands of dollars on this reform committee. We have had meetings upon meetings, and we have had representation from this committee. To date, we have seen nothing coming from this committee in relation to reform. Another failure on behalf of the minister. Last night, I mentioned to you the common entrance examination, or the 11 plus, and we have to continue to speak to this. Because in 2018, when the Barbados Labour Party came to power, they said 
that they were going to replace the common entrance examination with some other form of assessment. Three years later, there is still confusion as to whether or not the common entrance examination will be used in 2022. A few months ago, at using continuous assessment in order to transfer students for this coming school year. Whilst continuous assessment would afford persons the opportunity to have a few bites at the cherry, we also have to be absolutely careful as to how we are going to do any continuous assessment for the 11 plus examination and how would you do it during this pandemic when students are online and parents are heavily involved in their children's work would we be testing the students or would we be testing the parents so common entrance this year certainly cannot have the component of any continuous assessment. We will have to seriously look at the reliability and the validity of exams when we are treating to this. The Democratic Labour Party has solutions on the way. There are ways and means of transferring students across Barbados in a fair way. We spoke earlier about middle schools. We spoke earlier about schools of excellence. We spoke about full zoning. We spoke about partial zoning. These are issues in education that we need to look at again and find the most suitable way to transfer students across schools in Barbados. If you are saying to the public of Barbados that all schools are equal, then why can't students who live in St. Philip go to Princess Margaret Secondary School? Why can't Princess Margaret Secondary School get some of the cream of the crop? And why can't Harrison's College get some at the lower end? We preach about peer teaching and peer counseling. In education, we continue just a lot of talk. But I believe that it's time for us to get serious in Barbados with education. We spend millions upon millions of dollars in education. And there comes a time when we have to get value for money. And I want to assure you that the Democratic Labour Party will take the bull by the horn and get education back on track once elected to governance in this country. We built or commence construction of a school meals, an ultra-modern school meals facility in Six Roads. When we left office in 2018, it was practically completed. Three years later, the Minister of Education cannot tell you what is the latest on that. But that is nothing new. Because any project started under the Democratic Labour Party, the Barbados Labour Party puts the project on hold. We cannot continue to do that in Barbados. You will recall the St. John Polyclinic, which was left idle for 14 years and immediately on regaining office in 2008, 
we had to find every opportunity to complete that polyclinic in St. John. So where we had projects to be completed, we are asking the public of Barbados to give us the chance to complete. And so, as I said before, we need to find space in our secondary schools so that our students can be taught face to face. We need to reduce the role of our secondary schools to under 800. Those large schools in excess of a thousand cannot continue to carry those numbers. And we are going to find ways to reduce those numbers. Before Ronald Jones left office, he had promised and has started to identify an area in Searles in Christchurch to construct a secondary school. That would have relieved the pressure on our secondary schools across Barbados. There was talk recently about reopening the Alma Paris School. Therefore, if we can reopen the Alma Paris School and we can commence construction of the secondary school in Sirs in Christchurch, I believe that we are well on our way to reducing the overcrowding in our secondary schools. All our schools, all of our schools in Barbados have classrooms built 21 by 20 feet or 21 by 22. Hardly any classroom in Barbados is bigger than that. With the pandemic, that size classroom can house at least 20 students. So where we have classrooms with 28 and 30 students, we need to be able to take out the top, well, take out eight either from top, bottom, or middle, and reduce class sizes in Barbados to at least 20 at the maximum level. In the nursery schools, the maximum is 15, and I believe that we need to look at a maximum in the primary and the secondary. And we will work on that. I believe that we can also find a creative way to ease the pressure in the upper school, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth form schools. I believe that we can find a creative way to have those students attending school in the evening. There are schools across the Caribbean that use a shift system. Dominica is an example of a school, of a country where schools use a shift system. There are students who will go to school from 8 until 12, and then there's another set that will go from 1 until 5. And that is done because they do not have enough space. I believe in Barbados, we can consider doing similar, especially during this pandemic. Because I will maintain that we cannot continue to have our students at home online. Because too many of them are not online. So it is okay to say that school will start on the 10th of Jan January online and that on the 24th they will be going out face to face. It's okay to say that. But I want to ask the minister tonight if the Ministry of Education was able to find out from principals at nursery, primary, and secondary schools, what percentage, what percentage of students were online last term, and if everything goes well this term, whether or not there will be an increase in the number of students online. And I doubt it very much because we are in the silly season 
And I'm sure that a lot of our students are going to be caught up with the posters on the polls and the, the, the noises and the people walking around and they will be distracted. Some of the parents will be on the campaign trail allowing students therefore to manage their own education. That is not what we are spending over $500 million in Barbados for. We are spending over $500 million in Barbados to ensure that our children are educated and educated to the best of our ability. We are spending that money in education because we believe that education is necessary for the proper socialization and development of our students and of our society. And so as we launch into this second term, I want to encourage parents to ensure that students utilize all the time available to them to get instruction. Teachers are complaining about the stress of the online teaching, but the teachers are prepared to do it because at this point, that is the only solution being offered by the Ministry of Education. They have not offered any of them, by the way, any proper furniture or anything of that sort but they continue to put teachers under severe pressure and severe stress in trying to teach online. Forgetting, of course, that there are teachers who are parents as well, who have sometimes two or three children, and they have to be moving from child to child, assisting with devices, trying not to have distractions in one group and the other. It is not easy teaching online. And I believe that we have to spend time making a distinction between integrating technology and online education. I believe that online education is not for primary school students. Online education is for adult education. And the shortest possible time that we allow our students at the primary and the nursery level to be online, the better for this country. We have students who are very, very technologically savvy. Some of them are sharper than their teachers. And when you think that they are online, they are not online. Supervision, therefore, has to be critical. And it, try to imagine a 12-year-old child trying to do his online class and supervising a five-year-old sister and an eight-year-old brother because the parent is at work. And it, it, it begs the question that we have to look at our welfare services as well. Because too many of our children are being left at home to do their work and to plan their education. There will be another opportunity for me to, to speak to you on education and on matters relating to this general election. But my time is up. And I want to thank you for listening to me. I want to thank you for listening to all the Democratic Labour Party candidates as they speak to you during this campaign. And I want to assure you that we will be there for you. We are here to serve and we shall serve you. Good night and God bless. All of you, thank you. I'm
From Pedro, you can hear the passion, his, his passion for education. That is his thing. Trade units, but his passion is education. I can say too, I have two little ones in my household, nine and eight. And at every opportunity that I them gets, they move from in front of the tablet. One pull at the next one or hit the next one down through the house running. What you want to wait? It is a difficult, difficult thing. And this government has not been creative at all. It, there are several different schemes that could have been used to get some of our kids supervised while their parents are out working. The hardest thing for a 4 to 11 is supervision at school. You can't put a, a, a seven or eight year old to sit down and keep quiet unless somebody is supervising them. And, 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 and working class people have to go to work. And our children have been suffering in silence for two years. I have a little bit to say for about half a minute. I want to ask some questions to those listening. And my simple question is, if you give a government 60 months, in other words, 60 months from May last year. And by law, they can take the election for another couple of months. I, mean, I think it is three, so they can go down to 63. And after 30, I think some 32, they pull up stumps, throw away the ball, and break at the back. And then the Prime Minister puts on the telephone post in Barbados, vote for a Prime Minister. Walk across Barbados. You are Prime Minister of Barbados. You have at least another 18 months to make decisions, to make changes, to improve programs, to bring policies. 18 months. You pull up stumps. And then puts up. Put up. A sticker on Barbadian telephone saying, vote for a prime minister. Is that not telling us not her? Is that not telling us not her? And I would support that by saying that if you go and read the prime minister message when she called election, she said, whoever emerges as leader, I will support. I ain't too bright. But clearly, me and Molly was telling us, telling the world and telling Barbados, this thing getting too hard. The people around me are not united. They're complaining too much. And therefore, I want you all to go out and pick somebody else and I will support them. I think that is logic. But she now last night telling the people in the night before telling the people in Bashar Yard yeah, that if you the working person in a house, then people can't expect you to, to be helping them. She got to get other people to help them when she go out and work. It was only so for her. This is the first time in the history any leader can say. I cannot support my constituents. So ladies and gentlemen, you know what to do. The Prime Minister does not want the job, and we have Verla de Pisa that wants it. She is willing, she's anxious, capable, and honest. I want you all to make sure that she gets the job by voting for the candidates of the Democratic Labour Party. And we are bringing, I'm going to bring you what I call a man of extreme bravery. His size and his age do not match strength of character and heart. This man takes on 
person, masculine. We got one in Greenwich. He ain't fighting for them. When they give them economic analysis, he brings his. And he brings it in language that people like me that can only add and subtract understand. And he decides he's going to take on the mantle for the Democratic Labour Party in the city of Bridgetown. And after the fighting inside the city of Bridgetown for who going to run for the Labour Party, I am confident that he's going to mix them up there and walk up the stairs of Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, the next representative for the city, Kemar Stewart. Good night to everyone. Good night to the viewers online. First, I'd like to start by saying that I am very happy to be here with you, uh, Democratic Labour Party family. I am extremely pleased to give my contribution this, this evening. Uh, so far, the campaign has been going excellent. I'm very proud of all of the candidates in the Democratic Labour Party. I'm very proud of our supporters. I'm very proud of the people of Barbados for standing up for democracy. Although we have a, well, had a 30 love, then we went to 29 to 1. But our members stood firm and supported the DLP and brought us to the point where we are at right now. And we are enjoying every moment of it. And most importantly, we are serving the people of Barbados, which is our utmost priority. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who made this entire thing possible. And lastly, let's just give thanks to God Almighty for bringing us here. And he's the man that will see us through come the 19th of January, 2022. So I'll just get right into this evening's contribution. And I will say that I, I grew up hearing that the BLP was the party for the merchant class or the business class. And since this government came to power, we have seen that the government adopted what we call a pro-business agenda. They didn't have anything much to do with poor people. And you can look to it yourselves. Think back. When the government basically let in the COVID on us, because I can recall members of the DLP calling for early shutdown. But no, they said, no, we can't shut down the country. What's not, what's not. And they let any COVID on us and they robbed us of an old year's night. I can recall it very well. I don't know if you remember, but I do. Let's go a step further. They shut down the small shops and allowed the supermarkets, the big supermarkets to open during Corona. If that is not showing you where their loyalty is like, I don't know what else to say. They also went as far as to saying, well, only the big tour companies can transport the persons from these cruise ships to the airport, the same cruise ships that destroyed our coral reefs. Up to now, they still didn't make any investment available to repair the reefs. It was an act of humanity in taking the ships from languishing all over the Caribbean Ocean because nobody else would take them. But you need to be cautious in that you're not trampling the country in a bid to extend yourselves more than you can. Something very interesting occurred in Barbados. When the DLP lost, there was this perception or this taint of so-called corruption, which this government came to power aiming to be different. But they did even worse than they alleged to the Democratic Labour Party. Because this year's per per perception of corruption painted a very grim index of state corruption worldwide. 
Because the COVID-19 was not only a, a, a health crisis or economic crisis, but it was a corruption crisis for governments. Let's just take our interest to radical investments. They came out and they said that the vaccines are supposed to save lives. So if the vaccines were supposed to save lives, why they are trying to be corrupt in the... <laughs> They try to be corrupt and make money off of the vaccines. It's supposed to be a life-saving issue, but still they have time to be corrupt. If the international media did not highlight what was going on, we would have never known what was going on with the vaccines and radical investment, which is an entertainment company bringing vaccines to a country. That is corruption, and something should have been done about that. What's interesting is that the colonel, he was involved. He was the Minister of Health, and his permanent secretary signed a correspondence. And he said he didn't know anything about it, and he still has a job. Like I said, he walked away from the city of Bridgetown. Because he said he's not getting to serve the city as he would like, and he came into politics to serve the city. So therefore, in his bid to serve the city, he resigned as the MP to go and be Minister of Health. That shows where his priority is. He should have stepped down as Minister of Health and continue to represent the city if that was his intention. But it shows you where his loyalty will lie. Good man, just bad company. The other instance is White Oaks. In the very first couple of days when the government came to power, White Oaks Advisory Limited, Another stage of corruption. So corrupt that the Financial Times wrote in their newspaper that the government was overpaying for services at $85,000 per month. Anybody worked for $85,000 a month? Just raise your hand. Let me see. Anybody? Anybody? In the I can't see anybody. $85,000 a month. Instead, they came on the TV trying to fandangle their way all around the issue, speaking about, oh, it is worth the money. And, and, and they have their henchmen running around talking about that. But White Oats was one of the very first scandals associated with this government. So the public needs to remember. One very important issue to the Barbadian hearts is that of these, 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 these reserves that the government continues to speak about. Because Mia Motley borrowed, and she borrowed, and she borrowed, and she borrowed. I've never seen borrowing like this in my entire life. I haven't heard anything about earning reserves, because we need to earn reserves. And I think that that is the way to go, as opposed to borrowing, because as we continue to borrow from the IMF and these international banks, and let's not, include, let's not exclude the Chinese government, because you've borrowed in excess of over $400 million from the Chinese government with no plans of repayment. We had the debt restructuring, which would have robbed all of those persons from their treasury bills, the money that was due to them. They cut the pension. Because I remember when Janice walked around Bridgetown with her son saying that they cut her pension. Because I can tell you from time if this government gets back into power, they're going to cut your pensions. Think back to February last year when the IMF said that Barbados is due for pension cuts. And the same Kevin Greenwich came out and said that the government is not responsible for any pension cuts. I still do not know who he works for, by the way. I'm not sure if he works for the government of Barbados or if he works for the IMF. All I know is that we pay him. And I will say again that we need to start thinking about earning reserves because the same thing that happened under an ONAFA administration when they went and borrowed, 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 then when the Democratic Labour Party came in, they had to pay all of the money that they borrowed, which would cause a tumbling and a slide of the reserves. The same thing they went and did again. The funny thing about it, Miss Motley was involved back then, now she's involved again. So, what do you think will happen? Let me not speak about the extortion prices that we face in the supermarket. When the pandemic occurred, 
The merchants took the opportunity to raise prices on people. In a situation where the unemployment was so high, the NIS was running out, and people were not earning money, they took the opportunity to price goals on Barbadians. Because one very important thing that was said that I think that we missed is when a merchant stood up next to what we called Dwight Sunderland, who was then the Minister of Big Business. He said, well, the merchant said that the NSRL was not responsible for the high prices in the supermarket. But still, the last government campaigned about the NSRL and what it was causing this inflation and what's not. But the merchant said that was not responsible for it. Because we had the basket of goods that could have protected low-income people from having to pay that tax. But any time that's any measure or type of taxation measure that's implemented to help this country, you have the henchmen that will come and ask you for a vote to go to parliament to serve corporate interests. But they will not serve the interests of low-income people. They will not serve the interests of teachers. They will not serve the interests of nurses because they still won't pay the nurses. Colonel, you got to pay the nurses. Because in between the Colonel and me, trickery and deception. You can attach which name to which one you want to feel like. Trickery and deception. Because the nurses want their money and they're being taken for a ride and that is unfair. That is wrong. So I'm urging the Democratic Labour Party when we take office that we need to prioritize the issues of the workers. We need to prioritize the issues of public servants because this administration, in my opinion, is helping to destroy the confidence in the public service. And you can just look at the jobs that they're giving to all of their friends, all of their families. You can just look at the amount of people that they're buying out. They're just buying people and buying people and buying people. They even took a man well, let me see, let me see. They even bought a man. They bought a man from Brass Stats to come and run in the city. This is the same man that sat on Brass Stats every day saying, I'm not interested in politics. I don't want to go in politics. I'm not interested. But now he's interested. Money talks and we know what works. I said one man, but it was two. Because they took another one and made him the COVID advisor for him to come on TV and repeat what the thousand advisors they had before were saying. Ronald Chapman, the, the czar. We know about Liz, but I won't go, I won't, I won't go out there. I don't know she loves me because she's always talking about me in Barbados. She is, she is fixated. But I love you too, Miss Henrietta. I love you. But more serious issues need to be addressed because I believe, and you have seen, that the government is ignoring the plight of lower-class Barbadians, or what they call or perceive to be lower-income Barbadians. Because the only thing they could have done for youth in Barbados was to put us on the road to sweep the ash. I'm not against giving people work that you can earn an honest dollar. But what about the thousands of persons graduating from the University of West Indies with degrees? What about those persons who have an interest in entrepreneurship and building businesses? What about those young persons who are trying to get loans to try to build their businesses? What about the bank that they said that they were going to put at the post office that it could come and access to get loans? We still have not seen that. We've, we've had the, the trust loans program. But what they did was to trick people and say, well, look, if you have a little shop or what's not, just, just to save you from the impact of the corona, come and write the information here and we can give you a little $200 a week or whatever to suffice your thing, your thing. They look at big people that own shops and want to give them little energy change. But they will let those persons know who signed up for that program that to expect your tax bill. Because that was just a trick to get your information to find out who are, or who hasn't paid taxes. Because as soon as they get back into power, 
that tax bill is coming right at your door. Mark my words, it's going to happen. I don't wish for it to happen, but it will happen. So I'm just letting you know very early what the position is. I cannot believe that during a pandemic, a government who professes to be caring will take advantage of people. People who were suffering, people who were begging, people who were crying. And a government will seek to take advantage of people at its lowest, when they're at their lowest. People's, people have died throughout this pandemic. I, I, like I said, you got Liz coming and saying, well, my condolences to you. Imagine somebody's mother just passed away at Harrison's point. And you have to hear, well, uh, my condolences to you. That is disrespect and hurtful to people. Because it seems as though you're joking at death. We have an election that is right in the middle of a pandemic. After the Prime Minister says, we will not have an election in a pandemic. But the election is still being called in, in a pandemic. But like Derek said, I believe she's now scrambling. She does not want the job. Because we heard the condescending attitudes. We hear the disrespect. We see the bullyism. We see the despotism. And I think Owen Arthur was on to something. Because true things, true things are never a lie. But did we really listen? So I am urging Barbadians before we get even further into what you call a spiral of destruction led by a confused person who's confusing the entire country, does not have a clear path for us other than listening to the IMF. Because there's no way that you can go in from running a deficit to running a 6% surplus in one year. That's amazing. That's destructive to people and it's hurtful to people. The two biggest line items in Barbados in terms of government expenditure are wages and salaries, transfers to government to stay on enterprises to make sure that you have your jobs running to make sure that the government department's running. And the IMF has always said that we need to cut the public service. And that's exactly what Mia Morty is doing. They started with 1,200. You can go back and look at the Barbados Today article. Passad, Greenwich, Maskell, Carrington, all of them. But Carrington is another discussion because there are allegations going around about the government accessing the private accounts of nurses. And if that is so, hey, it should be rolling. But I realize when you make mistakes in here, you get rewarded and promoted for failure. We had the biggest cabinet under the last government. Now, some persons alarm, they had the interviews, you even had Miss Ford in the back saying, yes, yes, yes. And we heard it. But when the government came in, they appointed 27 or 28 ministers. And the colonel, who has only done, where well, he was in opposition, but he, was only, he only spent one for a year term in the city, and he is out. How many other persons dropped out? Persons are tired of the bullyism. And even if Miss Motley's team, they too are they feeling the disrespect. We see the treatment meted out to everybody who does not support the government. And I will urge this country to get up and go and vote against despots and dictatorships. I'm telling you, if you elect these people again, the pain and suffering that's coming, you're not going to like it. The pressure that's due from the IMF, from borrowing all of this money, 
is going to come. They continue to keep us in lockdown. They have us in the middle of an uh, Omicron outbreak. So what are they going to do? They locked us down when the numbers were lower. The numbers are no high, but there are no lockdowns. Because they want to have an election. They want to run an election. So they want their renter crowds to come out. Because I'm being told that they're paying everyone to follow them about in red shirts. I'm being told that, that, that persons out there are, 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 are chasing their candidates, their BLP candidates from off their step. But the good thing is the Democratic Labour Party has been there. You've been listening to the people. You've been crafting policies. And we have a vision for the economy of Barbados that will see us not cap in hand to the IMF, that will see us earning our reserves, that will see us gradually reopening our economy so that our locals can benefit. Because nobody should be running the country. Real life is more cheaper and more affordable for tourists. But your local people, you're burdening them with taxes. And then you put the taxes mostly on the lower, the lower persons and the lower social classes and ease the rich. Never have I seen such benefits for the merchant class ever. But the eight ministers of finance, <laughs> your time is short, and when the Democratic Labour Party takes office, our policies will be the policies attached. We're going to attach our policies to the fortunes of our people, give them hope, inspiration, and most importantly, upliftment to their lives and, and, and families. So again, I want to wrap up by saying that I am challenging you. I am challenging you, Barbadians. I am challenging you, members of the Democratic Labour Party, to get up and to go to the polls and to vote for the party who has your best interests at heart and to vote for the party and the leader who will not sell you out, but to keep your interests at heart. I thank you. Have a good night. And most importantly, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kimar. Thank you. Thank you again, Kimar. Every time I hear you speak, I see the, the future of Barbados in good hands. Organized brain, focus on issues, put in a little personal issue, back to the issue. Well done, Kimar. Well done. And I know you're going to do well in this city. Now, I took up my, my, my phone and I looked at a WhatsApp message. And it told me that Pedro Shepard's argument about online teaching for children was so awful and so devastating that in the United States, they stopped online teaching for primary and even secondary schools. Now, you don't have, to, you don't have to, to do an examination all the time or research. You, you can look at practice and what happened in some places. I know there was a fear about how oh, your children are going to be supervised. But at the end of COVID, because it's not going to finish next week or next month, what kind of loss would we have suffered with our primary and secondary school children? I'm talking about the ones that died or sick. School, school is about attention span. It is about interacting. It's about social relations. It's about understanding your role, manners, discipline. It's about going. 
And you have children all day locked in front of the screen. It cannot go on. It cannot go on. Now, <clears throat> this party is such a great party. This party is a great party, trust me. Trust me, it is a great party. We have, we have so much variety, so much, so much different skills and talents. And, and I don't know, I used to be associated with the independence committees. And I have a very, very good friend, Clifton, who used to be president or chairman of the St. Andrew Independence Committee. And every time I heard about a competition, something organized, something happening in St. Andrew, I would hear a name come up. I used to say, Audrey, Audrey, now here Audrey, Audrey, by the end of those names came Skeet. He's accepted the responsibility to bring St. Andrew back to the Democratic Labour Party. All indications are that he's been doing well. I went up into Chalky Mount just before the elections were called. And that is what I do on Thursdays now. I, I get him use my, my red pass and I get on the bus and I go and visit a community in rural Barbados. And I, I just happened to go to Chalky Mount. And I went, they had a bank sitting, banks and me and my other partners who, who take that tri trip, sat down. And of course, a little politics came in and I was told, but Skeet doesn't have to bother up here. He is already a household name in Chalky Mount. Orlin, come and address your audience. Orlin Skeet, St. Andrew. A pleasant good evening to each and every one. It is indeed an honor to stand before you, not only as a proud resident of St. Andrew, but as a candidate under the auspices of this noble and great party, which have done tremendous work over the years, called the Democratic Labour Party. The Democratic Labour Party has stood in the vanguard for the people of Barbados from the first time it took office in 1961, and has been doing tremendous work up until this very point. And I dare say to you that the time has come for us, what they call the new brigade, the young and vibrant set of candidates under the leadership of our president, none other than Verla de Pisa to take the responsibility and answer the call and the cries of the people of this, our fair land, Barbados. We, the people of the Democratic Labour Party, do not take this opportunity of January 19th, 2022, this upcoming general election lately. Reason being, there's a growing sense of dissatisfaction and displeasure. And that displeasure and dissatisfaction brings great discomfort to many people 
if not all Barbadians across this country, and even some in the diaspora, because some of those would have heard the cries of their families when they make that call home to see how their relatives are doing, how their childhood friends are doing. And when they hear the cries and the pleas of the hardship and the turmoil that had been foisted upon our people within the past three and a half years, I am sure that they wish they could have done more to help themselves and their families. Because the kind of remittances that it would take from them to help their families. I know we often said that people in those states in America work three and more jobs sometimes. But they might even have to work eight to find that kind of money to suffice the hardship that people are facing within this current dispensation. And it's not only those who we see at the lower end of the scale. Because what was known to us as the middle class is slowly but surely diminishing. Because the burden is not only on those at the bottom, but the burden is on those across all sectors and social demographics across this country. And many will say that they often hear people criticize and they often hear people complain. But what are you going to do about it? My friends, I say to you, give the Democratic Labour Party that chance and we will show you how things can be turned around. We, the people of the Democratic Labour Party, with the collective will of the people of Barbados, can get it done. All you have to do is go out on January 19th and put your ex behind the candidates within your constituency who represent and hold the banner high for the Democratic Labour Party. Because we believe within our hearts of hearts and we know with the kinds of plans that we will bring to you starting from this Thursday and our manifesto launch at Braden that you will start to see the light on the course that we are going to be taking you on, not the course that you're on that you're asked to stay. Because no one wants to stay in separation and despair. You need a better course to go on. I heard pundits and people of good economic standing making the point that Barbados' economy needs to grow by double digits. But saying that it needs to grow by double digits and not putting measures in place is an exercise in futility. And we need more than just an exercise in futility. We need actionable plans that can show the growth that is necessary. We need policies and initiatives that are not highfalutin, but are easily implemented and that can bring meaningful benefits to people all across this country. In every sector in this economy, you find their niggling challenges for a number of years. And the people of this country has been promised public sector reform for some time. And you have an administration in place right now who has promised much, who have walked the length and breadth of this nation proclaiming that they're the white knights, that they will deliver you from your pain and your tax burdens, and they will bring relief. But my dear friends, I ask you this. What have they delivered? To whom they have delivered to? And where it has taken us as a country? And I want you to reflect on these three things. Whom it has been given to, what they have been given, and where we are at right now. Because I'm sure when you look back just some three and a half years ago, with all the turmoil that the economy was in, with all the downgrades that we have suffered, 
with all the taxes that were put upon the people, we were still paying our debt locally and internationally. And Barbados as a sovereign state has never before suffered the fate of defaulting on its local debt and its international obligations to those lenders overseas, which we hold in high regard as a proud nation, the gem of the Caribbean. But now, in this current dispensation, across the Caribbean and in the wider world, we are known as the people who are coming cap in hand to borrow, borrow, borrow. But it's understandable because this same administration for a number of years has made many people across this country mendicant. People who only get jobs in the public sector because they're politically affiliated. Many people are square pegs in round holes and causing many hindrances in the public service because people do not get jobs on merit and qualification. They get jobs on who they know. That, my friends, is not the democracy that our forefathers worked hard for. That is not the Barbadian way. Many of our foreparents are probably turning in their graves because the blood, sweat, and tears that they've been through to give our people a good standard of living is slowly dwindling before our people who are living right now, our very own eyes. We have been educated and we should use that education not only to prop up a society, but to rebuild a Barbados that is meaningful and that is profitable so that our children and our children's children can have a bright and prosperous future and not one that is an albatross around their neck because of the consistent borrowing and the taxation that is foisted upon them. Because the current administration will not be around to pay the taxes that are, and the expenditure that is borrowed. But you, who have your children, and your children's children who is to come, will have that burden on their necks come the next two to three decades. And I ask you this, is that the course that you want for yourself? Is that the course you want for your children? Because at the end of the day, it is the right of those who are put in authority that is tasked with the responsibility of managing our fears should stand up and man up and woman up and say, well, look, we have not done right by our people. We must try to make amends. But rather than doing just that, they run willy-nilly ad hoc and rush back to the people of Barbados in a pandemic that they said they would never call the election in. And to say to you, look, give us a new mandate. Can you imagine that you have a house in construction and you offer a contractor the opportunity to build that house for you. And the contractor brings your house to seven or eight courses of blocks and tells you that he needs a new contract to bring it to ring beam and put on the roof. Can you imagine this kind of madness? The first thing you would do is ask that person to leave your property. And the first thing the people of Barbados is doing, it should do, is to ask the Barbados the Party Administration to the mid office and allow somebody who can handle the affairs go out and do the requisite job. People across this country are suffering. People across this country are murmuring. People across this country are in the doldrums. This administration has turned Barbados into a gimme gimme state. At every turn, somebody is begging, begging, begging for something because the, the living standard that we are at is not what our people deserve. But they found themselves in no other position. They're not begging because they want to. They're begging because the choice is nothing. When you have little or no choice, you take the option that's presented to you. We look at it. The state of homelessness. Mental illnesses plaguing people across all sectors. Children are on the street roaming daily because the education system that we normally accept and that we hold so dear is not doing enough for our children. And we must ask ourselves this. 
can better be done. And I'm sure that you are thinking that better can be done. And I agree with you when you think that better can be done. But better can only be done when people of vision, when people of insight, when people with foresight take up the responsibility and take the task and go forward in earnest to do right by your people. The Democratic Labour Party, my friends, is ready and willing to stand in the breach for all Barbadians to take this country forward in a progressive, decent, diplomatic, but most of all, democratic way. Because we believe that each and every citizen has a right. Each and every citizen has a voice. And all ideas, all, con all concerns must be heard and must be adhered to. Because the people are the ones who elect parliamentarians to office and not the other way around. And when you are given the opportunity to represent people, then the onus is on you to do just for the people. To whom much is given, much is expected. Can you believe that the people of Barbados went out in their numbers on March, on May 24th, 2018, and like no other, gave the Barbados Liberal Party administration all 30 seats. Because the people of Barbados bought into the strategy and said, well, look, we want these people to administer on our behalf. And lo and behold, before even four years, they have come back to the people asking for a new mandate. Do you believe in your hearts of hearts that anybody given a time frame of five years to complete a job, knowing full well that the job is not completed, should be coming back and asking you to do the job again? It is not right. It is not just. And it is not pleasing and desirable. And if you are honest citizens, you are proud citizens, then you are, my dear friends, the craftsmen of your very own fate. And your fate is in your hands on January the 19th, 2022, the year of our Lord. Go out from 6 a.m. until 6 p.m. and give the Democratic Labour Party your support. Your support will mean this for Barbados. Democratic processes continuing. The upliftment of people in and across this country. The restoration of good and decent jobs. Because I hear people talking about minimum wage. And much is said about the minimum wage. But we must understand that the minimum wage is not doing just for our people. We have to start looking at a living wage in this country. Not a minimum wage. The minimum wage is just not cutting it for our people. But when we look at living wages, we look at what it takes to have a family, to survive for their children, to provide income that they can have allowances, to look at medical bills that would occur along the road, to look at giving them an allowance where they can set aside money for their children's education because that is vitally important. But we are still in the rut, spinning top in mud in this country. We've handed out tokenism to people, much in part to the unfortunate situation of the volcanic ash coming from the La Soufrière volcano in early April of 2020. And people have been going out, especially young people, most of them now coming into the workforce in this country. Can you imagine that you are bringing our young, vibrant people into the workforce for the first time and a caring government 
who claim so much would not even give the people that they pretend to care about national insurance, which the slogan says is more than a contribution, but it's your lifeline. Can you imagine that you're not providing the lifeline for our very people? And you want to come back and tell the people you deserve a new mandate? And not only that, you want to provide more tokenism. So you're cutting the people now to give others income. So what you're doing is giving them become because to employ some other ones to fit them in. So you can feel grandiose within yourself and walk away and beat your chest. That is not good for our people. You are exploiting the very right of our people, lowering their dignity and their standards, but all for political expediency, all for self-aggrandizement. That is not the Barbadian way. That is more the plantocracy way. But we, the people of the Democratic Labour Party, are bringing you the democracy. Because we believe in democracy. We believe that every single citizen of this country has a right to be uplifted, to provide for themselves and their family. And if I was the Minister of Transport and Works, I would not have a situation that occurs on every morning. People loitering on the steps of my constituency office and around people residents waiting to find out instructions of where they're going to be going on the day or if they're going to be working on the day. Oftentimes on mornings, I see people loitering on the constituency office of the minister. Not at a depot of the Ministry of Transport and Works. Where they should be going. But they're loitering around the area, waiting and hoping for instructions for the day. This is what I would have done if I was that minister. When those people were brought in to do the job, which was necessary at the point in time, when they were filling out their applications, take the names of those persons, but find out from those people, because we know the ash is not going to be in the streets forever, but find out from those people, what are your goals and aspirations? What do you want to achieve in life? Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? And given the responses of those people, there are people in this country who are retired persons like my friend Derek, who has much to offer through volunteerism because volunteerism is what built this country that we call our very own proud Barbados. Those people who have much to offer can be brought into a program and at least one day of the week, take those very same people you have on the street and offer them classes and courses, programs, whether it's skill, whatever you may call it, whatever the people deserve. Bring in the requisite persons to give them at least one day of the week a training facility that they can empower themselves and not lift themselves, that they can go on to be entrepreneurs and give people meaningful and sustainable jobs to help build this economy, to help boost the national insurance and make Barbadians proud again. But rather than that, we are giving people tokenism and walking about and telling people we deliver. We deliver our people into the pits, into the pits of what is called poverty. That is not the Barbadian way. We had a situation that occurred in the middle of last year when we had what is termed the freak storm. And then we have shortly after, in a matter of weeks, Hurricane Elsa. Many people suffer the unfortunate situation of damage to their homes and property. And it would have been thought that a good and caring government looking after the interests of all Barbadians, would have done more for their people. But we have turned to the people of China and said, well, look, we want 150 houses for the people of Barbados. Can you imagine that so many artisans in this country are on the bread line, or what used to be the bread line, because the bread line has been so heavily traversed that has now become the breadcrumb line. 
Because there's no bread, there's just crumbs there for people now. Because the funds for the people are being depleted. But a talk provoking minister, just like how we had the people from the University of West Indies going out in a pandemic, risking their lives, trying to seek information door to door. You'd have got those same students who you proclaim to Barbados that you're giving back, removing the tuition fee, but you still got those children putting in labor to make back up the time. But that's another matter. We will deal with that on another occasion because there's other people to talk about education. But a caring minister would have used, utilized the skills of those students in conjunction with the staff of the National Housing Corporation, Urban Development, and Rural Development, and use a facility like the Sagrafi Sobers Gymnasium because it's spacious and we want to follow the COVID-19 protocols. We do not want to put our very own people who we care about at risk. Advertise from the Sunday until the Wednesday that you're going to be there in this particular location from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. We're going to have two groups of 25 persons working in conjunction with the people from the staff of the National Housing Corporation and the state-owned enterprises. Asking all artisans of Barbados to come out to this job fair that we've been holding. They will follow the protocols because the lawyers can stand for the center. The Garfield Service Gymnasium has a spacious car park and people can enter from varying points. And we have 25 people because we do not want to keep our people out there taking out in the sun too long. But those persons coming into this job fair give their credentials, state their position, and then the government of Barbados going into a public-private sector partnership with the warehouses and the general stores of Barbados who provide materials for building enter into a partnership with those people. Provide the requisite materials to the homes of all those that you have sent out persons from the DOs and the varying organizations to collect data on because you already know who the persons are. And given that responsibility, employ those same artisans who have come to the job fair. And I'm sure that by the end of the year 2021, all those people who have suffered the fate of having their houses destroyed or damaged to their property will have been refurbished already. Because we have quality craftsmen and skilled labor in Barbados. But we are saying to our people they are not good enough. So we have to bring the Chinese. But we are still asking those very same people to stay the course with us. We are still asking those very same persons to come back and give you a fresh mandate. When you have neglected your responsibility of helping out the very own people that you care, that you claim to care for. Barbados must open up their eyes. Too long have the people of Barbados been living in a fool's paradise. The time has come for you to stop letting politicians make mock sport at us, but to ask them and hold them to account and go forward on January 19th and vote for the people of the Democratic Labour Party who will bring integrity to you, who will bring a new focus for the people of Barbados who will empower our people and lift them up, not giving them a handout, but holding their hands and giving them hands up because we believe in bringing our people up the ladder. My friends, I thank you. One people, one constituency, one Barbados, one love. God bless each and every one of you. United for sure you can trust the Democratic Labour Party. The serve the people, serve the people, serve the people, work for the people. Serve the people, serve the people, serve the people. We go in with DLP, one Barbados for you and me. We go in with DLP, DLP for all of you. We go in with DLP, one Barbados for you and me. We go in with DLP.
solid, solid as ever. Solid, solid, solid. Great stuff. Great stuff. Alwyn, Ski, St. Andrew. Very, very, very well done. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I used to be director of Urban Development Commission up until 2019. And therefore, whether I was technical or not, I had some idea about housing construction. And I think it would be a little bit <clears throat> nuisance of me if I didn't say just a few words about the housing situation in Barbados. So it's only, I want to go in this place because I heard the Prime Minister is to build some mama for monka houses. The Prime Minister is to build some high number of mini stadia. And I asked myself, if you knew you wanted to do these things, stay the course and do them. You don't got to come and ask us to vote for you to do them. But let me just draw a little instance to you. This government under Marley put in their manifesto that they were going to rid Barbados. They were going to rid Barbados of all the pit to toilets. That they were going to go on a campaign to get rid of every single pit toilet in Barbados. Whenever one of these members come to you, any of them, that representing the Barbers Labour Party, any of them come to you. Just ask them how many of these pit toilets have gone. They also promised that they would have changed every roof in Barbados that was a flat top to a 30 degree roof because it would be more hurricane resistant. I want you to ask Miss Morley and her team how many of those rooftops have been changed? Mrs. Morley promised to restore all the empty buildings, all the dilapidated buildings in Bridgetown in three years' time. Ask Miss Morley how many of those dilapidated buildings or derelict buildings in Bridgetown have been fixed. Ask her how many. Miss Morley said that she was going to transfer all the tenantries in urban Barbados. Ask Ms. Morty how many tenantries have been transferred in her three and a half years. I can give any numbers. I can give any numbers, but I want to ask them as they come to you. Ask them as they come asking you to give them another term. Ask them. They got a new manifesto to construct a one bedroom house in Barbados is about $75,000. A two bedroom, that's about $105,000. And a three bedroom, about $125,000. These are the new prices. These, these were changed since Ms. Morley came into office. They used to be 62, 80, and 105. The Chinese house landed without the base. You have to construct the base for this house. The foundation is about 25 to 30,000, depending on the kind of soil you find. If you go to do a, a, a strip or you have, you have to do it like a deep strip, the price will vary because some places you got six inches of mud, some places you got 15 feet of mud. So that would make the difference in the cost of the foundation. But these Chinese houses coming to be put on a foundation and landed at about $140,000. And we could send to Suriname or Guyana and get hardwood and come in for about $120,000 for a three bedroom. A little, could be a little bit more, so maybe if you use the purple heart. So what is the magic with China? What is the fascination with China? We go on the other side of the world to bring in some houses that cost them more than what we have, can produce them for. And what all the labor that is being used in Barbados is to build the foundation. The Chinese are coming and putting them up. What is the fascination with China? 
Well, I think this election can answer that. Vote for the Democratic Labour Party and the questions about China will be answered. Now I say this as I call our next speaker. Speaker, Mia Motley sat on a great throne. Mia Motley is about to have a great fall. All the wise kings and economics guru cannot put Motley back together again. We have a mixture of first-timers and seasoned campaigners. Our next speaker was the Minister of Tourism. I will say, and the evidence will support me, that there has never been a better Minister of Tourism than Mr. Richard Seeley. St. Michael South Central, Mr. Richard Seeley. Well, 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 when the best Marshall I can tell. Well, 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 Seeley no land. Huh. Oh, Seeley and breathe. Thank you, thank you, Derek, and uh, greetings to everyone out there and all of all of you who are tuned in through the technology. I am delighted to have this opportunity to share a few serious thoughts with you. You see, they say behind dark clouds there's a silver lining. And as much as you didn't want a general election, as much as I didn't want a general election, as much as the individual who called the election did not want a general election, we are having a general election. And it provides us with an opportunity to get this country back on track. I'm gonna share some information with you this evening that in my view, can strengthen the case for the reason why this government has simply gone off course. It's kind of ironic they're saying to stay the course, but they have picked up such a serious speed wobble and have gone off course. It ain't funny at all. You say it's safer with Mia, the same Mia who said in October it would be reckless and irresponsible to have a general election in Barbados during a pandemic. Numbers of infections are at an all-time high. Yes, the daily numbers. And we are in the winter season and our source markets are also seeing record daily highs. And we are allowing our tourism industry to go through unfettered in a situation where now you have Omicron, you have Delta, and as if that wasn't enough, I understand that they're combining the two now. We got another variant. And then another variant independent of that as well. Is this really the time to be having an exercise like this? I mean, social distancing and virtual meetings and so notwithstanding, it is just not what the country needs. Just came off of a Christmas celebration. 
You had a mandate for five years. Don't tell me that you need to have a general election to make tough decisions. So what really you were elected to do in 2018? To make easy decisions? So now let's give you a fresh mandate so you can make the tough ones. So you're only making the easy ones with the earlier mandate. Now I heard the chairman asking some very salient questions with respect to the Urban Development Commission and the clear lack of industry that has taken place since 2018. You know, reflect on that point and ask yourself, What new has this government done? You know, they don't have anything new. No pro All of the major projects were started under the last government. The last government that they claim didn't do anything was a good thing we had the last government. What, 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 what would they have to show? They haven't done any sowing. All they're looking to do is reap. Complain about the high act. You know what they did? Make it twice as high and twice as wide. That's not one of their projects. You know, you know in the manifesto, they list a whole set of private sector projects. Not one was started since May 2018. I challenge you, 56 pages. No, I didn't read the entire manifesto because I must confess, I nearly fell out the chair I was sitting in when I saw sandals in the Barbados Labor Party manifesto. Sandals. All of the lashes that I took, all of the lashes Chris Sinclair took, all of the lashes the Democratic Labour Party took, and they actually found the temerity, as late Branford Tate used to like to say, they found the temerity to put that in a manifesto document, complete with the illustration and all, why can't believe it? Sandals was the worst thing that ever happened to Barbados in their minds. And even after they came into office, they said some very terrible things about the, the, the then chairman of Sandals Resorts International on the floor of the House of Assembly. And now you want to be re-elected in part because of 44 rooms at Sandals. Why haven't you got the 300 plus rooms or rather the 500 rooms going at Sandals Beaches in St. Peter? That's what should be in your manifest. That's what should be in a manifest. That's what should be happening. All of that was left on the drawing board. Piddled around with the Sam Lord's Castle project. But now you finally have to get that going. And you know, the word is that they're going to lose all three of those St. Philip seats. And the treatment of the people of St. Philip on that Sam Lord's Castle project alone is reason enough why all should go. But you think about it. All. All of the initiatives I really started in the Democratic Labour Party. In the constituency that I once represented and will be representing again soon, St. Michael South Central, the Constitution River Enhancement Program, you know, well, I have to be fair, that really started under the Owen Arthur administration, came through to the then Democratic Labour Party administration. And yes, we got it going, got the, 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 the 
second and third phase going, yeah, you know that this government trying to take credit for that? Why, I mean, come up with something. Oh, I don't, nothing at all to show. And we need to get our projects going if this country is to get out of the mire that it's in. You cannot borrow your way out of a crisis. You have to earn your way out of a crisis. And I'm going to talk to you a little about that. But before I get there, just to say, on this issue of this government and the last administration that was way more industrious, built schools and hotels and all sorts of houses galore. They have nothing to show in three and a half years. But even at the level of fundamental promises, the Barbados Labour Party went up and down the lengths and breadths of Barbados talking about corruption. And they needed to rectify that. Transparency would have to be in the land. They promised integrity legislation where it is. Where it is. I don't tell me about the papi show that happened in Parliament where it went to the Senate and was defeated. You know your numbers beforehand. You never wanted to pass it. You never had any intentions of passing it. Three and a half years. Why don't we have integrity legislation? Plain and simple. And don't tell me, no, they're trying to make that an issue on the platform. No, I don't believe them. And you don't believe them either. Because if all of this corruption was so rampant, who has been charged? I mean, really. Now, all of a sudden, a general election campaign to unite the nation, are you making all these snide asides at political meetings? I would think that a prime minister trying to unify the nation, according to her, she needed a general election campaign to do that. I would have thought that there would be issues of importance given the pandemic and the economic situation we're in. But apparently, no. Every night is entertainment. Up and down the stage, like if she's performing in a tent, a Calypso tent, and got everybody's name in her mouth, including mine. This is not, this is not that type of election. We just had a change in the status of the country, the Republican status. You want to bring to the country a Republican constitution. You're dealing with a pandemic fight. You're gripped in an IMF program and you can't find issues to talk about in a general election campaign. You, you find time to call in everybody. She called about 15 people's names last night, you know. One body to the other, going all down the line and back to the top again. The Democratic Labour Party is, of course, focused on issues. And the one major issue is to remove the double standards that exist in this society. Hence, that very simplistic but powerful theme of one Barbados. That's what we are about. And we also have to think about our future. And we must take on board what our situation really is. And I think it is useful to listen to what others are saying. Now, if I tell you that the debt 
situation is totally out of control and there is no apparent solution to it. Or rather, this government has no apparent solution to it. You could argue that I, I am a politician. I might be trying to embellish the situation, engaging in a political point scoring exercise. Well, that's not the case, but I will tell you. You can't say that about the International Monetary Fund. And what they said coming out of the last consultation that they had, the Article 4 um, of the agreement requires these, uh, these consultations. Barbados has borrowed 22% of its gross domestic product. Its 2020 gross domestic product. $2 billion. That's what we have seen. $2 billion. 2018 to 2019, $200 million from the Inter-American Development Bank, $300 million from the Caribbean Development Bank, two loans, $150 million each. The IDB loan has to be repaid in nine semi-annual payments of Barbados, $22.22 million. Repayment started in late 2021, month before last, November. So $44 million a year from 2025, 2022 to 2025. Last year, from 2020 to 2021, last financial year, you had three so-called pandemic loans, $600 million from the same IDB, and then another $200 million from the CAF, the Latin American Development Bank, $200 million from the World Bank, and $520 million from the International Monetary Fund. So we have this $2 billion that Mia Motley has engaged in, and your children and their children have to pay it back. The worrying element, and I am sure this is what has led to this election call, is that there are tough measures that have to be taken. All of that borrowing means that our debt to GDP, 150%, the highest in the region. Jamaica is next with 106%. But as I say, the only way we can get out of this is by earning, not by borrowing. In 2020, we saw a contraction of our economy by, of 18%, the largest in the region. So when we start to use this pandemic, pandemic, pandemic as an excuse, a convenient excuse, it's not going to wash all of the time because other parts of the Caribbean booming. Cayman Islands, the same Jamaica who have a debt problem as well, they welcome their millionth visitor since reopening from the pandemic here the other day. A different type of tourism product, but the point is they're getting on with the business. We making excuses. While a prime minister continues to audition for what I don't know, PR and spin and everything else. But what about ordinary Barbadians who have to deal with this? This impacts what the government can or cannot do in the future. It impacts everyone. And with this contraction, even with the growth that they have predicted of 1.2%, we are still 16% below 2019 levels. And let me make it clear, the International Monetary Fund provided this information. This is not the Democratic Labour Party talking. Those are the robust 
bald facts that we find ourselves in. That, that those are the facts. So we need a, a robust and mature debate to get us out of this. I mean, let us face it. Tourism has to come back up to the mark. But at the same time, there are many other industries that we need to explore and develop. And indeed, the Democratic Labour Party is about making sure that we can have sustainable development going forward as far as the economy is concerned. We also recognize that these, the occasions have warranted an assessment of the delivery of social services. We cannot allow our social cohesion to be in any way undermined and certainly not ruptured. We've had tremendous success in areas of education. However, the current system is seeing a lot of students fall through the cracks. Our primary education system is not producing a critical mass of persons with a strong grounding in the basics. And we have to address that. And these deficits are working their way through to the secondary and tertiary level. And when you talk about the digital age, and this links right back into what I was saying about diversifying our economic base. This government just can't seem to get anything right now. The only thing they're getting right is PR. That's all. That's where it begins, and that is where it ends for this Barbados Labour Party administration. And we need to get past this narcissism and all of this behavior that suggests that people feel they're entitled. The mistreatment of public officers, senior public officers being shouted at and hollered at, in fact, Ministers too. And that's why some of them decide that they're done. Because they ain't coming back to be treated like no child. We have to get past that. The public servants of this country have been the bedrock of our stability as a nation. And the Democratic Labour Party administration that will be sworn in in short order, will treat the officers the same way previous administrations did, with respect and understanding that there's no need to treat people in a disrespectful way. The high regard that we hold the service in will allow us to treat them as the important officers and servants of the people that they are. They're not there to serve ministers and be mistreated. They're there to serve Barbados. That's why they're called public servants. And just because you may have a situation in parliament that provides you with an unusually large number of seats, that doesn't give you the right big people as you see fit. Now, I mentioned earlier about the Prime Minister calling my name, among others, and it seems as though she had a problem with me discussing values because apparently that has no place on the political platform. That has no place in our national journey. Well, I, I'm sorry, 
but I don't agree. And <laughs> funny enough, one, one of the things I was discussing during that address that so bothered her was tolerance. And I, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to pray for her because uh, honestly, that erratic behavior that uh, is really not on. As I said, I, 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 um, I'm, going to, I'm going to offer a prayer for her because I was speaking about tolerance among those values that I think we need to work on. And yes, she went on to say some fairly not so nice things. But one of the prayers that I learn is, uh, Father, as we ask to forgive our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. So I, I'm not going to get into any, any squabble with with Miss Motley, but again, I, 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 would, I would urge her to maybe, she took the trouble to listen to my speech, maybe she should go back and listen to it again and hear what I said about, about tolerance as well too, because I think you could use some of that. And finally, before I, I give way, and on this same subject, I want to say I totally endorse what our president had to say in her first address as such, where she referred to God and her creator. I think the Democratic Labour Party is at one with the entire nation when we say that this Subtle or not so subtle agenda by insidious forces to somehow get us to move away from what has worked well for this country is something we have to watch. And it seems to me as though it, they have infiltrated the very heart of the Barbados Labour Party. But that is a matter for them. I know that it doesn't apply to us at all. And long may that continue for the Democratic Labour Party. I want to urge every single one of you to come out in your numbers and come out early and vote on the January the 19th for the Democratic Labour Party. Stay safe, do what you have to do, and remember, God loves you. Thank you very much. That was Richard Seeley, St. Michael, South Central, and the, 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 the evidence on the ground tells us that he will won on the 19th return to the place he left in 2018. Let me make something very, very straight about this thing about Creator and God. Make that straight. I used to believe in God. I no longer believe in God because I know, I know there's a God. I stopped believing because I know that there is a God. So I don't believe anymore. I know there is a God. That's me. On, I told you earlier that on Thursdays, I go and take a, a drive into what we would call rural Barbados. Because the truth is, much of Barbados can be considered too rural now. And on the two occasions that 
my little contingent went out. We went down to St. Lucie. And we went to Connell Town. And we went to Josie Hill. And, of course, people passing. And I be sitting down, engaging in a discussion. And they know that I am a them. So they ask if I come canvassing. I said, not canvassing, but I can listen to political statements and so on. And I, I was hesitant at first because one guy had on a bright, bright red shirt. So I was a little hesitant. And one of the other guys engaged the discussion and said, man, you, you coming down here to see if we can support Vrela de Pisa. I say they come for that reason, but I would like to find out what's the feeling. But I engaged the discussion went on, and by the time I left in both of those communities, I was satisfied that Vrela de Pisa had, was doing the groundwork that she needed to do and was making strong advance against the gentleman who had been elected to represent, but for some reason had defaulted and left the constituency. I am the general secretary of this party, particularly because my president said to me, you are no longer constrained by the public service where you work. Come and do some work for this party. I didn't need much urging, but that request has meant that I have been able to work closely with her. Warm, engaging. I don't have to tell you about her intelligence. She demonstrates it all the time. But what I like about her, that she's a team player. And I think she's been able to pull together a mixture of young, experienced, but all dedicated to service. And I know with God's guidance, and the commitment and strength of her team, she will do well. I just said at the beginning that I stopped believing God because I now know that there's a God. I knew that the day I was praying and praying for a reason to help Barbados to go forward. And me and Motley called election, and then I knew that there was a God. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Vrela de Pisa, our candidate for St. Lucie and the next Prime Minister of Barbados. <laughs> Good night, Barbados. Clearly, they were expecting me to turn up in heels again tonight. <laughs> yes. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be able to stand here in this space in George Street, the home of the Democratic Labour Party, and proudly demonstrate to the whole country how ready the Democratic Labour Party is for this election. You see, the thought that we were out in the wilderness and we didn't know what was going on in the country, we didn't even know what was going on in our own home. I heard all sorts of conversation going on, because it would have to be that, about how you can't get George Street sorted out, but you want to sort out a country. And I am so pleased to be part of this initiative here in George Street. <laughs> to show Barbados that you can do a lot with a little bit. Because the Democratic Labour Party 
since 2018 had to learn to do a lot with a little bit. And in 2022, Barbados is at a point where it has to learn that same lesson. Because today, only today, I had sight of the Article 4 consultation with the IMF. And what I saw would make me grow my hair if I wasn't determined to keep it short. Because we are being told that we are on track heading to the 6% surplus. And what I saw read negative 1.2%. That means we have to make it up back to zero and then head to six. And we have three short years to get there according to the timetable that was given. But I didn't come here tonight at this late hour to speak to you about so weighty a topic as the economy. There's going to be time for that. I want to speak to you, Barbados, about the creeping incursions into our democracy. Just as weighty, but you can rest back and listen to this one. You don't need a pen and paper for this one because you have been experiencing this in Barbados. And it started immediately. In 2018, after realizing that they had all the seats, we heard the first set of loose talk. We are going to amend the Constitution to allow the Democratic Labour Party to have seats in the Senate. And again, in yesterday's paper, I saw that folly repeated. Space for the, in the Constitution for the Democratic Labour Party to represent. Now, I can't speak to what happened in June or July. But by August, when I became the president, I can assure you, first of all, no such amendment went through Parliament for the benefit of the Democratic Labour Party, and no such proposal was put to me. And I want to make that clear, because already having won a seat under the Barbados Labour Party, Reverend Atherley has stepped over to the other side and declared himself the leader of the opposition. How he could be the leader of the opposition and the Democratic Labour Party is getting Senate seats. It don't work like that. That is not how the Constitution is structured. The change that actually took place in the Constitution at that early stage, though, was to make sure that Two persons who did not qualify to sit in the Senate could sit in the Senate. And I don't know about you, but I can't tell anybody what is the major contribution that at least one of them has made to the political landscape of Barbados or what wealth of information was brought that informed any of the debates in the Senate because I can't think of a single statement, never mind speech, made by that person in the Senate. The other man has moved a step forward, but unfortunately held a ministry of innovation that got nothing off the ground. Nothing. We're still waiting for the ID cards that we had presented to us twice. Still can't get it done. You can't get a basic license sorted out, the driver's license. But we had a whole ministry of innovation, and we changed a whole constitution for that. Right? But that was just simply a tip of the iceberg, because this iceberg had a lot of tips. This isn't, this isn't a peak. Because there have been 
constant incursions into our democracy and we kept blinking because somebody told us to watch. And for me, the major one was appointing a second deputy commissioner of police. They didn't even know that they couldn't do it. When I told them that they couldn't do it, they say I don't own a law because apparently I'm the one who never went to law school. So they said that it couldn't happen, that I said it couldn't happen, and they say they didn't know what I was talking about. And then they tried by stealth a couple months later to come and fix it. And they had to get outed. And nobody can tell me what was the major benefit to the country to have that second deputy commissioner. What did he do? What has he contributed in that additional space that we can say this was a wise decision? We understand the rationale for it. We get it. And Barbados is so much better off for it. Crime galloping away from us. And the only answers that we had to it were more judges, increase the sentences, reduce the incidence of bail, and still the crime out of hand. We won't even talk about the gun amnesty because that was a more shameful exercise. But to be fair, they are no not to work. You get all of the relics and the old things that don't work anymore that they don't know how to dispose of and they bring them and they give them to you. But you're not getting any of the Uzis and the Glocks that out there in service. You're not getting any of those coming in any gun amnesty. But we kept making these little changes. And whilst we were paying attention we weren't paying attention. So when COVID came and we were in a state of emergency, and rightly so, but they used that as an excuse to change the wrong piece of legislation because they changed the one to do with the management of an emergency that already had a structure set up through the DEMs that they completely ignored in the entire exercise, but they used the time whilst on the floor of the house, unprecedented. They presented the bill and then on the floor of the house inserted a clause to give one person, one person, the right and the authority to make rules and laws in this country. And for the first time ever, we ceded all power to one person in this country. And we were still not paying attention. It kept on happening. Our democracy under threat. And then the last and the biggest is the mockery made of the Republic. Now, I agree that as far back as 1989, we had the Ford Commission reporting and indicating that the country was in a mood to move to the Republic. But in 1989, my 20-year-old daughter, who can vote next week, Wednesday, wasn't even born. And nobody has had the common courtesy to ask her, never mind me, ask her friends, ask her schoolmates, ask her contemporaries what they think about a move to a republic. But we marched full steam ahead, bull in a china shop, and we were told... They pause the whole country, you know, because that is what happens when you have a new throne speech. Wipe the slate clean and come again. Never mind, there wasn't anything much written on the slate that you could account for. We're wiping the slate clean. And we come in again. And the flagship is the republic. 
And we were told that this was a cosmetic change. We were simply moving from governor general to president, and there was nothing to worry about. And just in case you wanted to worry, they waited eight months before they next talked about it. And on a day of national significance, in a most insignificant manner, to make what ought to have been a momentous announcement, and then to find out that what we were told and what we were getting were two completely different things, to find the entire country upended. It wasn't just about moving from one figurehead to the other, because we were used to a governor general who stayed in place until they chose to leave or until God called them home. And now we find ourselves with a president on a four-year term, which is scarily close to our political term of five years. An office that is not supposed to be political can't be anything else in that term. And then to cat spraddle the whole constitution because never have I ever in all my years of doing law known that you could repeal a law and the schedule to the act remains. Total and utter confusion. And we find ourselves in a situation where they pushed ahead with the Republic and we went into what ought to have been a stellar occasion, a red letter day, a moment in time. Up to now, my mother can tell me exactly what she wore on Independence Day. And most of Barbados will tell you that they're in their pajamas on Republic Day. Because we were home, only certain people were allowed out. And because we are friends with COVID, we could tell it to hold on for a moment, let the festivities happen. And to add insult to injury, on the day the night that we were supposedly moving and transitioning to the Republic, we named a new national hero. Now, we spent months in consultation to come up with the first batch. But literally in the blink of an eye, because I don't know who sat on any committee to determine anything at all. No disrespect to the awardee. But the process stank. You almost got the impression that the awardee didn't know neither. That as the leader of the country, as she then was, and will no longer be next week, was seated that it seemed to have been, I can't even say the expression that came to mind, but it seemed to have been a lawless thought in the moment. And we have another national hero. And all the while that we are complaining, that we're having no part to play in the formulation and the look and the shape and the feel of our country going forward. We were told that come January 2022, we would open discussions and deliberations on what our republic would look like because we have a book cover but there's nothing written on the pages yet. We got introduced to a charter and got told by the way that it doesn't have the force of law, 
So I can't figure what it was doing in Parliament because that is where we made laws. But we were told that we would have the opportunity come 2022 to have the deliberations that we were clamoring for to decide what type of republic we wanted because there are several different types to decide what type of bill of rights we wanted because the world is looking different these days and facing a completely different direction to decide what we wanted to have included and what we wanted to leave out and lo and behold on Boxing Day, Bank Holiday, we learned that instead of discussing the serious business of the country in January 2022, we were recklessly being thrown to the wolves of COVID in a general election. And we find ourselves again watching on as the incursions into our democracy continue because left hand don't know what right hand is doing or perhaps they hoped that they could keep it a secret but one comes out and says if you have COVID you can't vote and the other comes out and says Diana Trudeau we waiting on an opinion and within 24 hours we learn that if you have COVID, you have been disenfranchised from voting. For the first time in the history of Barbados, since the 1940s and 50s, a government of the day has found a reason to exclude people from voting. And Barbados, this must be the last incursion into our democracy. It is a most awful position that our country is in. But fortunately, Fortunately, we have been given the opportunity to right the wrongs that were done in the last three and a half years. The full on frontal assault on our democracy. And that moment in time starts six o'clock in the morning on the 19th of January. Because that is your first opportunity outside of those who will go Wednesday of this week in the special election. That is your opportunity, Barbados, to signal your disgust at how scantily our democracy has been treated in a mere three and a half years. And don't be vexed at the recklessness because it gives us an early opportunity to fix it. And don't mind that it demonstrates that the government of the day, or should I say the government of the night because the time and the tide is about to turn, don't mind that the government of the day cared so little about your well-being that it could try to use political games to get an advantage. Don't mind that lives may well be lost. Several hundreds have passed and all we get is condolences at the end of it all. Don't mind all of that. Mind your health from now till then. Make sure 
that you are not one of the ones who are told you can't vote, you got COVID. Because Barbados needs you to stand up in the line on the 19th of January from 6 in the morning till 6 in the evening. And I will say it every time I stand up to speak. Stand six feet away from the person in front of you. Wear your KN95 mask. Go and buy one specially for that day. Keep it as a souvenir afterwards. Carry along your own pen. But mark your X for every single one of the Democratic Labour Party candidates, the one that is relevant in your constituency, to make sure that the democracy that is in our name and that is in the hearts of every one of us Barbadians is safeguarded and that the incursions are brought to a halt with immediate effect the morning of the 20th of January, and we celebrate on the day of Arrow Barrow. There is no supposition about this timing. We celebrate on the day that we celebrate Arrow Barrow that we have lifted that burden from off our backs. We have taken that foot from in our necks, and we can move forward safely aware that our democracy is secure Again, I thank you. Well, 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 I don't have to say anything after that. I want to thank all Barbadians. And I want to give a special thank you to those overseas who stayed with us all night. Some of them are in London and still up. Hits going up, hits going up all the time. I want to thank all who came tonight and spoke. And most of all, I want to thank all the technicians, all the support staff here that made sure that this thing was the smooth way it was. And all I can say now, have a good night, God bless, and we will be probably have another meeting on Wednesday. Good night.